right. Hi, everyone. I'm Dorsa Sadik, and today, along with Sid Karamchetti, one of my students, we're going to talk to you a little bit about this idea of shared autonomy and what robot learning can do in this space and what are some benefits of robot learning in this space. So the reason we're interested in shared autonomy is it does have quite a bit of applications. And one particular application that we're excited about is in the space of assistive teleoperation and assistive robotics. So more than 1 million American users actually use wheelchairs with, with arms on top of them for various types of tasks, like getting out of the bed or feeding themselves or putting clothes on. And, and it's actually pretty difficult to use these assistive arms for these types of various tasks, everyday type tasks. Here is an example of a person using a joystick controlling this Jayco arm. So basically the, the way the user is controlling the arm is through end effector control, meaning that the user is controlling six things at a time. So they're either controlling the angles, the op control, or they're controlling the, the linear position like X, Y, Z of the end effector. And if you see the video, if you look at the video, you can see that the person is pushing the side of the joystick fairly often. And what he's doing by pushing the side is switching the mode. And then that ends up being pretty complicated, pretty difficult and time consuming and makes it pretty difficult to do simplest tasks like opening the, the door of the fridge. So the idea that we have here is maybe robot learning can actually enable an, an easier and more intuitive control space when we think about these assistive type of tasks like assistive teleoperation. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this idea of latent actions, learning latent representations of action spaces to, to enable a much more intuitive and easier control space when you are thinking about some of these assistive teleoperation type tasks. And then I'm going to talk about how we can combine that with more traditional views of shared autonomy, like belief modeling over, over the, what the partner is trying to do or what the human is trying to do, and how that enables more precise manipulation tasks. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time discussing that. And then after that, I'm going to spend a little bit of time thinking about personalizing these latent actions and personalizing these interactions and thinking about how we can learn personalized ways of um, matching these latent actions to particular, particular dimensionalities that humans are interested in. And then very briefly, I just want to spend like a little bit of time discussing an application that you're very excited about, the application of assistive feeding, which has its own challenges. And a lot of these ideas can, can become pretty powerful in that space. So I just want to briefly mention the application. And at that point, I'm switching to Sid, who's going to talk about some of his work in the space of using language and conditioning these latent actions on language instructions. And that allows us to give a lot more clarity and, and, and be able to have a much, much easier way of using these, these these ideas, these latent actions to control the robot arm. So he's going to talk about our algorithm, Lila, language informed latent actions, which is a way of actually achieving that. All right, so let's just get into it. So let's talk about this idea of latent actions. What is it and why is it useful? So if you think about robotic arms, the assistive robotic arms, they're often dexterous and this dexterity makes them really useful but it also makes them incredibly difficult to control. Like if I wanna go from any point in the state space to any other point in the state space, I do need to control six things, six degrees of freedom. There is a reason that they exist and that makes them incredibly difficult to use and control. But the idea that we have here is that if we condition the, 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 the control on a task, on, on a context, then there might exist a lower degree freedom control space that is a lot easier and more intuitive for a person to use. For example, like if I know that this high degree freedom robot arm is moving on a sine wave, then instead of me controlling every single joint of this robot arm, what I can do is I can have a one degree freedom control space that allows me to control the robot. Maybe I can push press plus one and that gets the robot to go to the right and I can do minus one and that gets the robot to go to the left. And again, the only reason I can do this is that I know the robot arm is moving on a sine wave. But this is not a huge assumption, right? Like if I think about again feeding, if I think about picking up food items and bringing the food to a person's mouth, the type of motion that we take there is actually pretty constrained. So condition on the task of, of feeding, I might be able to have this low dimensional uh, action space that allows me to control the robot and, and be a lot more intuitive. So using this idea and insight, we decided to train a network that, that tries to capture these latent actions. So what we do is we collect a set of expert demonstrations. These could come from an expert or a caregiver where they provide a set of demonstrations of state and actions and beliefs. So basically the context that we are in. 
And then we take these demonstrations and we take an autoencoder like structure where we are encoding these demonstrations into a low dimensional action space. So, so we're not actually encoding the state, we're encoding actions. So originally our actions were six degrees of freedom, but now we are incorporating encoding them into a two degree freedom space, like moving right and left on the joystick and up and down on the joystick. And then we ensure that these actions are able to reconstruct the original high dimensional actions. And the way we are ensuring that that, that reconstruction is possible is by conditioning this autoencoder on the context. The context here is the states and beliefs. So here we have a conditional variational autoencoder where, where we are going to capture a, a latent action and a decoder that's going to be pretty useful later on for, for controlling the robot because now we have that low degree freedom control input. In addition to all of that, when you're training this autoencoder, you would like to also incorporate a set of priors on the loss function. For example, we would like the loss function to be reachable, controllable, temporally consistent, like in similar states, we would expect it to act consistently in a similar way. We would like it to be linear, and then we incorporate these properties as we are learning this latent action. All right, so once we have the latent actions, then we can have this smoother way of controlling the robot. Here, I wanted to just show a quick user study where on the left, we have end effector control, and then on the right, we have latent actions. And end effector control is six degrees of freedom, a similar control as I was showing earlier. And as you can see, it's pretty difficult to do mode switching. But on the right, it's a lot smoother to move between the shelves and do this task. This is a long horizon task of making an apple pie. It's a mock apple pie. But again, it's a lot smoother and easier to control the robot. And it's also a lot faster to, to control this robot with only two degrees of freedom on the right, as opposed to like six degrees of freedom on the left. All right, so, so that's all great. So that basically tells us that learning latent actions, that that's a pretty powerful way of coming up with an intuitive way of controlling the robot, a low dimensional way of controlling the robot. But the question is, is that enough? And, and for that, we started looking at some more precise manipulation tasks. And specifically, we were interested in food acquisition, which is picking up food items. And then here, we are looking at this task of picking up marshmallows. So this is actually from the harmonic data set, the task that was using the harmonic data set uh, from folks in CMU. We are basically reproducing the same task of picking up marshmallows. Here, Hung is using, and, uh, using latent actions, so our algorithm. He starts with pointing at the marshmallow that he wants to pick up and then he starts operating the robot. It's really smooth in terms of reaching. But now in terms of like placing the fork on top of the marshmallow, he like even goes from the side to make sure that he has the right depth like idea of like the arm like on top of the marshmallow. But the arm comes out empty handed and it's not able to pick up the marshmallow. So the thing that's happening here is that latent actions, sure it's great at these high level reaching tasks, but when it comes to these more precise manipulations, like there, it's not doing that well. And then Hunk himself is also like not having a good idea of how to do that. So, so the idea is maybe we could incorporate ideas around shared autonomy here, where the robot has a belief over what goal Hung is trying to get at. And if it has a good belief over that, maybe the robot can kick in and help with picking up the marshmallow if it knows that that is the marshmallow that Hung is trying to, to pick up. And then that's really the idea that we have here. Can we integrate latent actions along with more classical views of shared autonomy to do these precise assistive manipulation tasks? So our vision is, if you think about these high level reaching tasks, you can use latent actions for them alone and, and that's great. Maybe you can have a one degree freedom latent action that tells you if you want to, that helps you with picking up uh, the red cup or the purple cup. But if you want to pick up the cup with a particular style, like if you want to pick it up from the side or from the top, then you wouldn't be able to use latent actions alone and one degree freedom latent actions alone to do that. So instead, what we, what we propose is that you start using latent actions, kick, share autonomy kicks in and realizes you're going for the red cup. And because it realizes you're going for the red cup, it does the job of placing the robot arm on top of the red cup. And at that point, latent actions almost is released to you, released back to you to do this more precise, fine grained task of picking up the cup from the side or from the top. So, so that is kind of like the core idea here that tries to integrate these two. And in addition to that, we have, a, we have a set of theoretical properties here. So for example, we know that the system converges to the true goal. For example, using Lyapunov stability ideas, we can, we can demonstrate that even if the human is acting as disturbance, as a worse disturbance, we end up reaching the goal, reaching the ideal goal eventually. And in addition to that, 
what we can demonstrate is that if we add an entropy term to our loss function, you could actually change goals fairly late in the trajectory too, which is an interesting point because in general, like people make mistakes, maybe they think they're going toward the goal and we really don't want the robots to take it too seriously. Like we wanna always have the ability of changing our goals and adding this entropy term at the end actually helps us change our goals fairly late. So here's an example of that. For example, we start with the initial goal of going to the red cup. And at some point you're like, well, actually that's not the goal I wanted to go for. The true goal is the purple cup. I decide to change my goal. And, and even though we have shared autonomy, like we are able to, with this entropy term, we are able to get to the purple cup. So what we demonstrate here is that maybe at, the, at time step three, if you decide to change your goal, like with entropy term or without entropy term, you can still do it because that's fairly early on in the trajectory. But as you, you decide to change your, change your goal later in the trajectory, like time step six or time step nine, without the entropy term, it becomes really difficult to actually get to the true goal. But with the entropy term, you are able to recover. All right, so let me also show you this in practice. So I'm comparing uh, our approach with retargeting, which is very similar to end effector control. And here we are looking at a task of picking up a marshmallow, scooping icing. This is actually where retargeting fails. It's not able to scoop. It's always in this upright motion, in a stabbing motion. And then we are dipping the marshmallow in rice. And it takes like 86 seconds to do this task doing retargeting. And if you look at alignment, right, the robot never gets to scooping motion. We're never able to like get this more precise fine grain thing of scooping. But using latent actions along, along with shared autonomy, we're actually able to get proper scooping when we get to the icing. Uh, and then eventually you're dipping in the, into the rice and you're bringing it back to the plate. And it's, it's uh, faster to actually do this approach using latent actions and shared autonomy. And again, in terms of alignment, we are getting proper scooping here, which is exciting. We have also tested this idea with two users with disabilities, just to make sure that with the target population, the gap is the gap with uh, our users um, uh, are, are is similar. And, and we actually have seen similar results. So here are the trajectories um, using end effector control and latent actions plus shared autonomy. As you can see, the trajectories are a lot smoother using latent actions and shared autonomy and, and a lot more non-smooth when you're looking at end effector control. And then in terms, of, uh, in terms of the total time that it takes to do the task, we are looking at two tasks here, the dessert task and entree task. And both of our users, user one and user two, take a lot less time when you're using latent actions plus shared autonomy, including less uh, idle time of the robot as well. All right, so, so that was kind of like a quick summary of this idea of using representation learning, learning, learning representations of actions for the task of assistive teleoperation and how that can be integrated with more traditional views of shared autonomy and how that enables like more precise manipulation tasks. So next, what I'd like to talk about is, is this idea of personalizing these latent actions, right? So far, I've talked about the fact that we learn like a two degree freedom latent actions, and then we can use those two degrees of freedom. And then we hope that the user just gets used to it and adapts to it. But different users might have different perspectives on, in terms of what those two degrees of freedom should be. And that really brings us to this idea of personalizing. So kind of in the most like, um, the, the previous form that I've talked about, like the person can come in and press right on the joystick, provide an input H, and that results in the robot uh, to, be, to, to, to take an action A in the high dimensional space from state S. And we have this decoder that takes the input of the human H at time step T, takes the state, the context, and outputs a high degree freedom action AT. But the idea that we have here is that there's a human here in the loop and the human might have a different understanding of pressing right on the joystick. Maybe the human would expect the robot to move forward when I'm pressing right on the joystick, or maybe they would expect the robot to go up when, when we are pressing right on the joystick. And different people might have different preferences or different alignment models for pressing right on the joystick. So instead of taking this more naive approach of just like learning a single controller, what we are proposing here is a modular approach where in addition to this controller, that this, this, uh, this decoder that, that we have, uh, that, that basically takes the input up to high dimensional action, we're going to learn another component, which we call an alignment module. And what the alignment module does is it takes the human input and, and basically aligns it to a Z that could go into the, the, to the controller. 
So the question is, how do we train this alignment module? How do we learn the human preferences? So the way we learn this alignment module is by learning from some amount of supervised data, some amount of human data, as well as some amount of uh, semi-supervised semi -supervised knowledge or a set of priors and loss functions that allow us to learn this, this alignment model. So the data that we are collecting here is based on learning uh, humans' preferences. So, so we're using some level of preference-based learning here, where we are querying users. We are starting the robot in some state S1, and then the robot decides to move from S1 to state S2. And then we query the person, well, what joystick input would you put in to go from S1 to S2? And then we ask these types of preference queries from the user, and that provides some amount of supervised data for us to figure out what it is that the person wants to, wants to do. But, but this alignment model, it's a feed-forward neural, neural, neural network. We're not going to be able to learn that fully by some amount of data collected from humans. So in addition to that amount of data, you're also incorporating a set of intuitive priors that these, these alignment models should capture. And that semi-supervised uh, structure allows us to more correctly learn this alignment model. And specifically, we decide to put three priors here. So we put in the prior of proportionality. So what that means is if I push the joystick H amount to the right, and the R moves delta X amount to the right, if I decide to press it alpha H to the right, the joystick should move alpha delta x to the right. And we can incorporate that as a loss function as a proportionality loss into our, into our loss or a total loss function. In addition to that, we have reversibility, which says that if I'm pressing right on the joystick and, and the, 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 the arm moves delta x, uh, if I decide to press left on the joystick the same amount, the arm should move backwards minus delta x uh, in my workspace. So, so this is a reversibility loss that we incorporate. And finally, we would like to have some level of a consistency loss, which basically says that if I press H on my joystick and the robot is in S1 and does something, if the robot is in some state that's close to S1, it should do something similar. So, so that is a consistency loss that we are incorporating based on similarity of states and similarity of the action that ends up happening or, or the result of the action that ends up happening on the robot. All right, so incorporating all these loss functions plus that supervised loss that we have, we are able to basically learn an alignment model. Let me show you how this works in practice. So we're looking at this plane task of getting the arm move on a 2D plane while avoiding this, this obstacle in the middle. And what we demonstrate is that uh, in the synthetic case where we have different types of synthetic models of humans with some level of noise, we can show that the alignment error becomes much lower when we are using these, these proportionality losses. So here, um, the grays are showing no, no alignment or manual alignment. Red is perfect alignment. And, and yellow is our approach, which is using all priors. So as we add, start adding priors, we're actually getting lower and lower alignment error. We have also done a user study on the same task. And in the, in the user study, similarly, we see yellow here using all priors is performing better compared to the case where we are not using any priors or we are using no alignment uh, in terms of all metrics like task time and trajectory length and so on. And, and all of these are actually significant, at least across, across the no alignment and, and the case where we are learning an alignment model. All right, so that was quickly talking about this idea of personalizing interactions. So very briefly before switching to SID, I also want to talk about an application that I'm very excited about, and that's the application of assistive feeding. And the reason I think this is very exciting is that it is an interesting and difficult robotics problem, but it's also a very interesting interaction problem that we need to study. So how do you pick up food items and how do you bring those food items in the right pose to a person's mouth in a way that is safe and comfortable? So we have done some preliminary work here where we are basically figuring out the right food, we're learning the right food geometry and pose when we are picking up the food and we're bringing it to a person's mouth. And we're also incorporating a set of different loss functions, incorporating comfort, human's comfort, as well as efficiency, like how much of the food is being transferred to a person's mouth. And using this um, and, and a planning method, which is based on an RRT planning, we are, we are able to demonstrate that uh, we could have um, kind of like a, an angle agnostic way of bringing food to a person's mouth. So here the carrot starts upright, but the robot realizes that it should turn to make it easier for the person to pick up the carrot off the fork. And then I think in general, this is an interesting direction to look at. All right, so with that, I'm going to switch to Sid, who is going to talk about language and how we can use language as a, as a factor when you are learning these latent actions to make things a lot easier. So Sid, please take it away. Thanks so much, Dorsa. 
I'm thrilled to be here at the Robot Learning Workshop, and specifically to talk about some of our recent work on combining natural language with latent actions. The intersection of NLP and shared autonomy is an incredibly rich space, and one that our lab is particularly excited about. Not just with the work I'll present today, but looking to the future as well. But to truly motivate this direction, we need to answer a key question. Why language? We've seen how latent actions can be useful for various tasks in assistive teleoperation, and how they can naturally be extended to incorporate belief modeling and user-specific personalization. But what are we missing? Looking at some of the applications we care about, robust in-home manipulation, assistive feeding, it starts to become clear that users are not just going to be dealing with sets of fixed tasks. Instead, they'll be dealing with a spectrum, tasks requiring identifying and manipulating various objects, possibly in different nuanced ways. For example, given a simple item like an apple, depending on how I'm feeling, I could want to perform simple tasks like relocation. Let's bring it to the table. It's to slicing the apple in a different way, uh, you know, cutting it into wedges so I can eat it with some peanut butter, to lifting it up to my mouth to take a bite, and much, much more. This is our motivation for using language, not just for latent actions, but for shared autonomy as a whole. Language is both a natural and expressive means of specifying one's objective. Beyond that, it's compositional and it transfers across environments. Finally, being able to embed prior knowledge via the use of pre-trained representations, representations that carry common sense information and that aid in generalization are a very powerful tool. At a high level, our work on language-informed latent actions, or LILA, is trying to capture the spirit of using language for multitask disambiguation. I'll start by providing an overview of how LILA works at a high level before digging deeper into how we use pre-trained language representations, followed by some pretty cool videos of LILA in action. We're in a very similar setup to the latent actions work that Dorsa described earlier. However, now users get to provide a natural language specification before they start controlling the robot. In this case, the language utterance the user provides is grab the cereal bowl with the goal of completing the trajectory pictured in blue. The learning process is then a very straightforward extension of the original work. Recall that to train a standard latent actions model, we're learning a conditional autoencoder to map high dimensional state action pairs down to a low dimensional latent space, then mapping back up to reconstruct the original high dimensional robot action. With LILA, we simply augment this procedure by additionally conditioning on language embeddings, obtained by encoding some utterance with a pre-trained language model. I'll get into some more of these details in a little bit. Crucially, the data collection process remains straightforward and scalable. Like the original work, LILA models remain extraordinarily sample efficient. As a first step, we collect kinesthetic demonstrations in the lab in about 30 minutes, spanning a broad uh, spectrum of tasks on a fixed workspace while recording ourselves doing so. We then throw these videos up on Mechanical Turk to get three to five language descriptions for each demonstration uh, for training. As a whole, this entire process, going from collecting the kinesthetic demonstrations to crowdsourcing, takes about two hours, start to finish. After learning the LILA model, we can then deploy it, allowing various users to come in and perform different tasks. Crucially, they use language to specify their goal. For example, saying something like move the banana into the fruit basket to specify a different task, the trajectory shown in orange. In other words, language is disambiguating their intent. Rather than learning a single latent space, a single low-dimensional manifold for controlling the robot, language acts as a multiplexer, each utterance indexing a different, yet still intuitive manifold for a specific task. The rest of the user interface remains consistent with the original work. After using language to drop into the low-dimensional control manifold they desire, the user is able to directly use a simple controller, in our case, a two-degree of freedom joystick to operate the robot. And in doing so, they have the fine-grained ability to perform the tasks they care about because language is able to help focus their control space. But what's the secret sauce? How are we encoding and fusing language with state? And at test time, how do we ensure that we aren't mapping random utterances to arbitrary controllers? I'll start in reverse by hitting the second point because it's really important. A critical part of any real-world robotics pipeline is ensuring that robot behavior is predictable, intuitive, and safe. To ensure this, we take a nearest neighbor style embed then retrieve approach at test time. We first train our model on the utterances from the training set in an unconstrained fashion. Our language representations are formed by embedding each utterance with a pre-trained Roberta model. In this case, we used a distilled model since it was a bit cheaper. But then at test time, to make sure we're never mapping 
novel utterances to undefined latent actions and thus undefined, possibly unsafe robot behavior, we run similarity search. We encode each utterance using the same pre-trained model, and then we retrieve from the training set the most similar utterance. The embedding for this retrieved utterance is what gets passed to the rest of our latent actions model, thereby ensuring the model never sees any out of distribution language. However, um, and this is really the dark side, this is a strong assumption. In doing so, completely degenerate utterances, things like dax me the blicket, get mapped to some meaningful behavior when arguably the robot shouldn't parse this at all. Compositionally generalizing to novel behaviors is also out of the question, since we're always mapping to behaviors we've seen before at train time. We have work tackling both of these angles, and we definitely hope to explore this future, further in the future, but this is Lila as it currently stands. The next question is one of integration. Given the conditional autoencoder, what's the best way to actually fuse the language embeddings with state and latent action information? One naive thing that we tried was to just concatenate the language embedding with the state and latent action as an input to the decoder. We found that this didn't work too well, mostly because the dimensionality of the language embeddings dwarfed the dimensionality of the state action inputs. Instead, we decided to use film or feature-wise linear modulation layers to fuse instead. Not only have film layers been shown to work extremely well in multimodal tasks across language and vision and language and reinforcement learning, but they're also easy to implement and remarkably easy to train. Each film layer takes in a language embedding and outputs a scaling factor gamma and a bias term beta that are added to an intermediate activation within the decoder, shaping the representation. We found these to work really well for our experiments. So what's the verdict? How does Lila actually perform in practice? The bulk of our evaluation focuses on real-world user studies with actual people. Given a video, no sound or captions, of the robot performing a task, we ask each user to provide a language instruction. We don't introduce any bias or names for objects on the table. We let users use whatever language they want. It's completely natural. Then they use the controller to try and reproduce the shown trajectory. Notably, we compare Lila to imitation learning, behavioral cloning with a significant amount of data augmentation, and we see the following. On the left, we see imitation learning, trained with 30 demonstrations per task and a ton of data augmentation, trying to accomplish the language instruction, pour the blue cup into the coffee mug. While it starts off by reaching towards the cup, errors start to cascade and very quickly, the model collapses into random jerky behavior and sometimes very unsafe behavior as well. However, on the right, we see Lila trained with only 10 demonstrations per task with an actual user from our user study trying to perform the same goal. And what you see is that the user is not only able to quickly adapt to the control interface, but they're able to deftly and efficiently complete a pretty fine-grained hard manipulation task as well. And that's Lila, folks. Fundamentally, a straightforward, intuitive way to fuse language and shared autonomy, specifically with a focus on task disambiguation. And while this is a great starting point, one that I'm personally thrilled to be able to share, it's not all that we're up to. Naturally, during the course of our user study, we identified some pretty interesting behaviors just by watching many users interact with the system. Obviously, our latent action controllers, much like an imitation learning or RL policy, aren't perfect and can sometimes miss the mark. For example, a user trying to you know, complete this uh, language instruction, grab the serial bowl, might end up at this state marked by the red diamond here. But because users retain agency with Lila, we, find, we found them shouting out different corrective phrases instinctively. They knew it wouldn't change the outcome in light of these near misses. For example, no, down a bit, or slower. It seems natural to incorporate these dynamic corrections into our system in a way that allows for adaptive online retraining. One paradigm I'm excited about is being able to use language corrections to retrain latent action models on the fly. You could even imagine a scenario where users switch to the full annoying end effector control, like Dorsa showed at the very beginning of this talk, to teach a task once, then quickly refine it over time using latent actions. Separately, while relying on the human po uh, to provide corrections is nice, some current work we have right now is actually trying to characterize robot uncertainty. What does a robot know? Can we use uncertainty estimates to identify the right time to have a human take more agency? Can we use language to explain the cause of the uncertainty? There is so much potential here and so much as yet untapped. Definitely reach out if you're interested in language and shared autonomy. And that's all folks. We've covered a lot of ground in this talk, building up our work in robot learning for shared autonomy. First through an explanation of the learn latent actions paradigm, and then extensions in belief modeling, uh, user personalization, and Lila, our approach for language-based task disambiguation. 
We also talked about some of the applications that motivate us, from assistive teleoperation as applied to in-home manipulation, to newer work on assistive feeding. But the story doesn't end here. We want to do more, and our lab's current research is looking at new paradigms for robot learning that cast shared autonomy as a bridge between full user control and full autonomy. In an ideal world, robots would be acting on their own to, for example, help us in our household chores, do the dishes, fold laundry. But as it stands, generalization and robustness, especially in light of novel scenarios, are hard. How do we use shared autonomy to help quickly teach new tasks and adapt to these new scenarios? What are the best interfaces for doing that and the most efficient learning paradigms? Stay tuned and watch some of the work coming out of our lab and more broadly from others doing research in the space as a whole. It's a really exciting time to be in shared autonomy and things are moving pretty quickly. Something tells me you won't want to miss it. Thank you all for listening and a big thank you to all of our collaborators for making this work possible. And a huge personal thank you to Dorsa for letting me talk about why language and shared autonomy is so cool. Uh, enjoy the rest of the workshop and thank you so much.